The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. I'm Alyssa Kalai, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the Playbook webinar. Today's topic is Lean Project Management and Visual Work Management, Eight Cues for Success in 2015, and this is a four-part series. Our speakers today are myself. I am the VP of Marketing at Playbook. We have Eric Graves, our VP of Product Development and Technology and Paul along our VP of Services. In terms of agenda, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Playbook the Company, and then I'll hand it over to Eric and Paul. Eric will be leading the discussion, and Paul will offer support. Um, Eric today is going to cover the interactive format of the webinar, where we left off from the last webinar, pull versus, versus push at the system and resource level, clear, correct priorities, project buffers instead of task buffers, how Playbook supports these principles, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. We'd also be really appreciative if you would answer a question regarding the value you received from the webinar in the form of a one-question poll at the very end of the webinar. So about Playbook. This solution was developed with a lot of effort over a long period of time solving a very complex problem, which you are all involved in, how to deliver high-quality, innovative products faster. The methods we're going to discuss uh, developed on solving this problem. We worked with over, se over several years with over 60 companies, both large blue chip, blue chip clients and smaller startups. This created a perfect environment for rapidly learning about what worked and what didn't in new product development. What all these companies had in common is that they wanted to deliver higher quality, innovative products to market faster. However, all of these companies suffered from the same problem. 90% of the products were late to market. So this is why we're here today to discuss some of the principles that these problems that combat these problems and improve product development success. With that, I'll hand it over to Eric Graves, our expert on making product development systems run faster. Oh, thanks, Alyssa. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, welcome back. Those of you who were here last time, welcome to the new people. Uh, we're going to have a little change in formats this time. We got uh, more people in this in this webinar, and we have more to cover in the hour that we have. So we're not going to have it quite be as interactive as before. Um, we're still going to have a periodic Q and A session, uh, two or three peppered through the uh, webinar. So as we go along, if you have questions, please enter them in the questions window, and we'll get to them periodically as we get through the webinar. All right. Um, so I'm going to start out just kind of uh, setting the stage based on where we were in the last webinar. In the first webinar, we looked at this current reality tree, which shows us many of the largest issues slowing down product development teams. Uh, we made the point that these problems are all interrelated. Solving only some of them is only going to accelerate our projects a little. Our challenge is to solve all of them if we want to drastically reduce our uh, development times. So in the first three webinars in the series, so this is webinar number two, we're in the middle of the first three portions. Uh, we're focusing on these issues on this side. And in the fourth webinar, we turn our attention and our focus to the problems on the right. In the first webinar, uh, we also looked at some typical economic sensitivities, you know, specifically the cost of delay of an average project being about a half a million dollars a month or about $25,000 a business day. Uh, which indicates the large opportunity, which lies in focusing a little more on project speed, a little less on project expenses. Ultimately, we saw the leading indicator of the health and the speed of our product development system is the size of the cues in it. By reducing the wait time, the time that tasks waste is sitting in a queue, we can accelerate projects. Here we have a reminder about what a resource queue is and what they can cost us. Uh, today, we'll be looking again at these queues and how to minimize them. But more importantly, we're also going to look inside this resource pipeline at the execution portion of our task and how to minimize that time as well. So recall that the main causes of the queues are an overloaded system, large batches, and uh, variability. Therefore, our primary means to reduce queue time is to address, address these root causes uh, by managing demand or sometimes increasing capacity uh, reducing batch variability and shrinking batch sizes. Again, we can't reduce all the variability in product development with also, without also eliminating all innovation, uh, which would also eliminate all of our profits. So 
So we, we need some variability. It's absolutely necessary for innovation. But there is that, that variability that we can reduce, for example, managing project risk or controlling resource availability better, as we discussed in the first webinar. So beyond these queue prevention methods, there are some corrective action, corrective methods we can use when the queues do arise and are necessarily variable system. Corrective actions include removing some work, moving it to a different resource who has some availability, or moving it to the front of the line. In this webinar, we're going to focus on the primary means of reducing system overloads, managing demand via pull instead of push, and the keys necessary to implementing that great pull system, namely clear and correct priority priorities. Uh, we'll also see today that these practices not only help us minimize queue time, but they also help us minimize the execution time on our tasks. So here's another one of the images we saw in the first webinar. lays out the foundation for this discussion on pull and priorities. So the top image here, first one we're looking at, we've loaded four projects into our system at the same time and spread our resources thinly across them. What we depict here is a situation where at least some of our resources are working on multiple projects. So what would happen if we push twice as many projects into our system in this top view? What if we had eight projects going on at a time instead of four? What would that do to the four that we have already in our system? Uh, approximately double their cycle time. Each one would get half as tall and twice as long. So what if we did the opposite? What if we hold two projects back and apply those same resources to instead focus on two projects at a time instead of four? How much do we accelerate our projects A and B by deferring projects C and D until later? Now we accelerate them quite a bit. And how much do we delay the completion of projects C and D by making them wait until projects A and B were complete? We didn't delay them at all. Yeah, we accelerated them too. And that's the key to uh, accelerating projects, is recognizing that when they're mostly work and a little wait, we do not really complete them earlier by starting them earlier and pushing them into an already full system. So certainly we're looking at here a big simplification of the hardware development system. You know, in hardware development, there's some obvious forced wait time in our projects, at least there seems to be, uh, namely the procurement time. Uh, in addition to that, we can usually overlap the end of one project with the beginning of another project as an engineer has become more available, but not necessarily fully available toward the end of each project. So these two complications can cause a lot of problems, most resulting from our tendency to overlap our projects more than we should. You know, the perception that we have a little spare time during procurement to work on something else, it's, it's really very often a red herring. Really, you know, we'll get to this more when we get to webinar four, but uh, it very often turns out we'd be a little better off putting some time into burning down some more risk on the current project and spending that wait time on a new project. So, In the meantime, the point is we can't usually get more out of our system by pushing more into the system. The opposite happens. We get less out of the system by pushing more into it. Throttling demand is how we control the rate at which work is put in the system so that we don't overload it. Now, there's two ways to accomplish this. First is pacing the system, only allowing one new project per quarter or per month, depending on the pace of our system. But that technique doesn't take into account the variability. We might not be done with the previous project when it comes time to add the next one. Adding the next one is just going to simply fill up the system and slow down the projects already in progress. So better is a second technique at the system level using work in progress constraints and pull. In short, being allowed to start the next project when we finish the previous one, when people become freed up from the previous one. So this takes into the current conditions of the system into account and accommodates the variability that's in it. And ultimately, the, the moral being that we have to hold back the next project or mini project or activity if it's going to slow down the current projects too much, which it most likely will unless there's already room in the pipeline for the new activity. So this view shows our product development system at a high level. You know, we're looking at the whole projects and the whole pool of resources. If we zoom in to look at a single resource and the pipeline of a single resource, we see the same things at the individual resource level. And we use the same techniques to manage it. So here in this view, we zoomed in to that pipeline and are looking at a single resource working on three different tasks. We see in the same result we saw in the, in the picture before. Now we'll revisit this view soon, but I just wanted to point out that the similarities between managing work at a system level and managing work and managing demand at an individual resource level, and that the impacts are the same. 
um, and they're best to execute it in the same way, using pull when there's space in the pipeline rather than push when there isn't. So again, we're zoomed in on the resource pipeline of active and completed work. Uh, before we expand on this view, let's quickly zoom out again to make a quick point about priorities. Um, so we were looking in the pipeline. Now we're zoomed back out to looking at the queue where everything is lined up nicely. Uh, again, every day these critical tasks sit in the queue is a day later that that project is going to be completed if they're sitting in there unnecessarily, as long as we're not forcing them into the pipeline and slowing down everything in the pipeline in, the same day, you know, in order just to get them out of the queue. That doesn't do us that much good, as we'll see more here. Um, but the point is, in this view, because criticality of these tasks is nice and visible and seems obvious what the resource should work on next, but unfortunately this isn't the way it works. It looks in most development companies, not to the resources executing the work anyway. To most of our development resources, it looks more like this. Everything seems critical. Everything's top priority. Everything has to be completed right now. Different people have different perspectives on what's more important, and each one thinks their projects or what you should, what people should be focusing on. And even when it's the same person, like a Kappa, like a quality manager needing help on multiple Kappas, when the priorities aren't made clear for the resources, it looks and feels like this. And this is a traditional push system as viewed from the resource level. And a traditional push system is one where work is pushed, you're loaded on the resources as soon as it's identified. And what do you suppose happens when we push too many tasks on our resources, when we create the conditions? of a pile of work like we see on the left. There are three big things. One is certainly the stress level goes up, the resources feel overloaded. Um, that has two other impacts. One is they end up multitasking and spreading their time across multiple activities just so they can tell the people asking them where they are with the task that they're working on it. And additionally, it encourages them to really take more risks and produce more errors by racing through things because the workload is just too high. We're going to spend most of this session talking about the first impact or the second impact, which is multitasking, uh, because that's really the biggest and, and primary impact of push systems at the resource level. So first to clarify the meaning of the word multitasking, we want to look at tasks on a somewhat granular level, separate the two types of tasks in our system. First is the work-based tasks. These are the sit down and do the work type tasks. Examples include run a test, build a CAD model, analysis model, draft a document, update a document, things like that. Where to sit down and do the work, every hour of work we get to perform on the task is an hour earlier that that task is going to be completed. Uh, on the other hand, there are the other types of tasks which are weight based tasks. These are more monitoring type tasks such as release the document, get quotes, receive some parts babysit the accelerated age task, things like that. In these cases, the duration of the task is not so directly dependent hour for hour on the availability of the resource. Uh, but work-based tasks make up a vast majority of the work in our system, especially when we have a lean system like we're describing today, so that's where we're going to focus our attention. Multitasking is when the resource is performing multiple independent unblock work type tasks at the same time. When you're working on a work task during a wait time of a wait type task, we don't call that multitasking. When you're blocked on one work task until you move on to working on another different work task, we don't call that multitasking either. This includes the mental blocks where you just need to take a break and you stand up and get away from a task for a little while so you go work on something different. That's not bad multitasking in our mind. Uh, also, when tasks are not independent of each other, we're a little work on task A depends a little bit on task B, so doing a little B before you finish A, that's not multitasking in our definition either. And lastly, when one task suddenly becomes a higher priority, and so you put down the task you're working on and move your focus to the now higher priority task, you come back to the lower priority one later, that's not multitasking either. As long as we're focused on the highest priority we can until it's complete or blocked, we're not multitasking. Multitasking is just spreading out the work because we unnecessarily put in time into multiple unblock independent tasks rather than focusing on completing one. And the result of that is an increasing duration on each of the work-based tasks, as we see in the picture. So a few more things. Notice the area inside each of these blocks 
is the amount of work required for that task. The duration is the horizontal length, and it's determined by how much work is in the task and the height of each bar, which is the availability we have to apply to the task. When we multitask, as we show in the bottom picture, we're applying our availability to multiple tasks, which ends up stretching each, each of the tasks out. But notice each of the lengths of the tasks are even longer in the multitasking mode because the area of the task is larger. We actually increase the amount of work on the task when we stretch it out like this. Why do we do that? How is it that we increase the work by stretching it out? Well, there are, there are a lot of reasons, actually. One is we forget what we did, why we did it. And remembering something later you know, takes a little bit of time. Uh, not to mention, there's time we spend switching between tasks, pulling up that next model or that next file to do that other task, all the switching cost of getting our head wrapped around what we were doing when we were there last time. And lastly, every time, every week a task go by, goes by and it's not completed, we have to tell somebody where we're at with it. There's more of the status reports. So those are three of the big reasons why there's more work when we multitask relative to when we don't. So adding work to an already overloaded system is bad enough, but that's not the worst of it. What's worse than adding a little work? Well, certainly how much do we delay the end of task A? You know, well, everybody who's waiting for task A has to wait a little longer, or a lot longer in the multitasking mode, and whoever's waiting for task B has to wait a little longer too. So we delay task A and task B, and how much earlier do we complete task C by starting it earlier? We don't complete it earlier at all. In fact, we complete it later. All the multitasking does is delay completion of some tasks without accelerating the completion of the other tasks. And in our definition of multitasking, it's all downside. So traditional push system forces the work into the resources pipeline and very often causes multitasking. The result is tasks themselves expand in volume or work and stretch out in duration. And it comes out looking like aqua fresh. So what do we need? How do we avoid this situation? How do we keep our resources focused on one task at a time until it's complete? Well, clear, and clear priorities is absolutely the most obvious thing. So that's what we're going to talk about and uh, even quantify the value of here coming up soon. And once we have clear priorities, then we can then enforce with constraints, only allow the resource to work on one or two of the two top priority tasks at a time, something like that. So with constraints of the resources are critical component of pull systems and important for reducing, for reducing multitasking. Uh, we're going to kind of delve into this a little bit more and talk about what we mean by pull at a resource level versus pull at a, at a system level. Um, in general, in push systems, at both the system and the resource level, work is being pushed in regardless of how the pull the system or the resource already is. And we can improve the throughput of the whole system by enforcing pull both at the system and the resource. So to clarify that again, I'll use uh, the example of Black Friday. Uh, I haven't personally ventured out on Black Friday, I've heard the stories, I've seen the pictures, and I can imagine, hopefully you can too. Um, so at the system level, it's very much a push system. Marketing departments are trying to fill the store as full as they can get it. There's an unlimited amount of work pouring in the doors, and as a result, there's too many shopping, sharing scarce aisles, resources. We're trying to squeeze into the little bit of floor space that's within reaching distance of the screen of the good deals, and things get all clogged up in those locations, and it takes everyone longer to get through it and get into line. So there are no limits on the use of those resources. The lines then, when we get in line, they get literally hours long because the cashiers are the really scarcest and most critical resource. This wait time is all because the system's overloaded. But it could be a lot worse if the cashiers weren't also weren't using whip constraints in a pull system. Cashiers essentially have a whip constraint, work on one customer at a time, and after each customer is complete, they pull the next one from the front of the line. Clear, correct, clear priorities being the next person in line. But without those whip constraints, the resources cashiers might feel the need to work on multiple customers at the same time. Different customers getting fresh, getting, getting antsy, getting impatient, they need to go, start asking for them to be checked out first, and our poor cashier might tend to start working on more than one customer at a time. You imagine what it would be like if the cashier 
started checking out every person who appeared in line and as soon as they got there, again, one thing from the first one, one thing from the second one, and so on through every person waiting in line, then go back and scan the next thing from the first customer, et cetera, et cetera. Multitasking across all of the customers in their queue at the same time. Yeah, I think lines are long now. I mean, that's, that's, that's basically a push system at the resource level and it slows everything down. First person in line really gets screwed. The last person still has to suffer through a longer wait time than they would because of all the extra switching costs involved. So with all the waste and delay we generate by operating this way, it wouldn't have to be Black Friday to overload the system. You know, imagine if we went to the grocery store. Every time we went to the grocery store, the cashiers are asked to check out everyone waiting in line as soon as they got there. And every, every time you switch from one person to another one, you add a little more work. So the lines are going to be huge almost all the time, even a random Tuesday afternoon. They have to wait in line for a long time at the, at the grocery store. And this is the conditions we have in product development right now. So fortunately, when the work is visible, when we can see the work, we've been smart enough to figure out that working on one thing at a time is better, especially at the critical resources. You know, in those cases where we can see the work, we sort of naturally establish clear priorities and whip constraints and pull. When the work isn't visible, we tend to do the opposite. So at the system level, we enable pull by managing the overall demand on the system, which has to share the resources inside it. For example, only letting 100 shoppers in the building at a time rather than an unlimited amount. This reduces you know, many of the clogs and the waste which happen at those clogs. And that accelerates the system. Uh, examples of how we would do that in product development, we would limit our the number of projects and many projects we have active at any one time. So um, examples where we've incorporated pull at both the system and the resource level are few because the system's really harder to see in its entirety. You have to see the work through the system. Uh, lean manufacturing though, that's a good one. You know, we don't no longer just dump a bunch of work uh, into the production floor without making sure there's room for it first. And um, cases where we have push at both the system and the resource level, those are actually pretty rare as well. Uh, but unfortunately, today's traditional new product development system is a glaring example. We don't carefully limit the amount of work we allow in the system and into each resource. Everything gets really stretched out. We start by gaining control and predictability over the resources at the resource level by establishing pull at the resources. That starts by making the work visible and setting clear and correct priorities on it. Okay, and that's all well and good, you know. How much, but how much benefit are really are we talking about here? How much benefit is there really to getting clear and correct priorities instead of uh, multitasking and single tasking? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. First, we want to. We have a couple of questions. We want to go ahead and take a, at least one of them. How are we doing on time? And we're doing okay on time. So, uh, let's go ahead and take one of the questions. Yeah. Which one do you got there, Paul? Okay. Yeah, we have a question. It's um, um, let's see. Sorry. Um, um, how do we know how many projects are too many projects in the system? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, there's a lot to that and it requires some pictures that I don't have uh, laid out. But in general, uh, there are a few things we need before we're going to know the right answer on that one is. One of them is uh, some measurements of our resources and their availability. How much does each new project eat up on the availability of the critical resources on the current projects? Um, that's one critical element to getting the right answer. Uh, there are other ones, you know, clear priorities on the projects. Uh, if you, you're familiar with cost of delay, that's a great way to establish some good, nice, clear priorities on the projects, but even that's not ultimately necessary. Um, but, you know, delaying project number one for two days versus uh, getting project number two in there, you know, if without priorities and clear impact of that delay, uh, then we have a hard time knowing how much is too much. So we have to establish that first. Um, let's go ahead and keep trucking. We've got more time for questions okay. later. Um, and we'll get to the other questions when we get if we have time for those at the end. 
Uh, so I want to get back in. So how much do the clear priorities really matter? How much do we stand to gain by eliminating the multitasking? Well, for example, here we got our three active work-based tasks. Each task gets three times as long. On average, you know, if n is the average number of tasks we have in WIP, the execution duration of every one of those tasks is n times longer than it's necessary, or more, more than n times longer. And how many active work-based tasks do our resources typically have on their plate at any one time? Yeah, usually it's a lot more than three. Um, so a little comment here. Certainly, you know, there's a fair amount of wait time in some of our tasks, you know, waiting for answers to questions, things like that. But still, it doesn't take very many of them to produce very similar stretching effects. And, you know, I'm not going to put the numbers to it, but a couple of tasks with a little bit of weight in them, you're still stretching things out quite a bit. So to eliminate those necessary, unnecessary delays, first and foremost, we need clear priorities. You know, so just a quick look at this again. How much do we hurt task C by making it wait until task A and B were complete? How much later do we get done with task C? No, we didn't. We got done with task C earlier, too. So clear priorities, even if all we have are clear priorities, and we don't know which ones are right, clear priorities are almost always better than no priorities at all on every single task. And certainly on average, they're better. But even on the, the most important task, even if we don't recognize it as the most important, picking one thing and doing it's going to help that one out too. Um, so, but how much, does, how much does it matter if we're really picking the right task? You know, can we quantify that too? We, what if what if task C was really the highest priority and the one that cost us the most by being delayed? Well, so just as queue time of critical task delays project day for day, it's also a day for day slip, and every day we're going to spend working on the wrong thing. Every day we don't recognize a task as being the most important critical task on that project is a day that we're going to move out the end date on that project. So you know every between unnecessarily stretching out projects, a little more every day by multitasking, missing the right priorities on a day here, a day there. You know, how, do, how does a six-month project become a one-year project? It's one day at a time. So how do we get our priorities right more often? So yeah, yeah. So we're, certainly critical path is a key indicator. You know, if we could just create the plan at the beginning of a project, generate the critical path to follow, and things went according to plan, so it'll all be real easy. Uh, unfortunately, things don't go according to plan in the variable world of product development. Not only is there a lot of variability, but we tend, you know, in our development plans to over-level, you know, and compress our projects to where we have multiple co-critical paths. Everybody's either critical or near critical, and when that's the case, priorities change even more often. And if we only have to update the plan once every couple of weeks or even less, there's no doubt we spend some days working on the incorrect priorities, and that's costing us time. Every one of those days moves our project that we're working on. Every one of those days we're working on incorrect priorities moves our project completion back one more day. Okay, so how do we get correct priorities? Two things, two ways to get. Uh, more correct priorities more often. One is we have a better model for our project. That's good plans, good granularity, good work estimates built by the people who know the work, you know, based on some some real data rather than just uh, guessing out of thin air. Um, the other thing is more control over the system. You know, our estimates, our plans aren't going to be worth the napkin they're written on if we're not managing the risks uh, in the process. Clear, correct, automatic priorities based on criticality. That's a big part of you know, having the, the right system or having the right priorities and good control over our model. Updating frequently, we talked about that. You know, we're going to talk about these a little bit more when we get to webinar three. We'll talk about how do you get good plans and how do you keep them up to date so they're always giving us good priorities. At webinar four, we'll get to talking about uh, how to manage risks and have a model that you can believe in for your project. Uh, lastly, um, you know, there's measured control of availability and utilization. We've been talking about that here at Poll. There's also using project buffers and not task buffers with visibility. 
Uh, so we're going to talk about that next. Very closely related to the discussion on multitasking. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and get right into that and take care of that as well. So one of the key methods out of the theory of constraints is the recognition that there is a lot of waste in our system from the use of task buffers. Task buffers are safe estimates for the task duration. So when we ask the resource, how long is it going to take you to complete this task? You know, they might realistically think it should take four or five days. They don't want to be late because they get in trouble for being late. They aren't really sure how much work it's going to be. They don't really have much control over their own availability. So they provide a buffer duration for their task. They tell you two weeks instead of one. Now, if they did never use any buffer they didn't need, that would be just fine. But that isn't the way it works out. You know, how often does anyone ever get done early with their tasks? Yeah, never, almost never, pretty, you know, 10 percent of the time, less than 10 percent of the time, something. And how often are people late with their tasks? Yeah, a fair amount more. 50 percent, 25 percent, sometimes even more. Why? Why are we always late and never early? You know, sometimes late and never early. Well, there's a saying called Parkinson's Law, which says the task grows to fill the time allotted. You know, the same effect is also the result of student syndrome. You hear the word student syndrome on a lot of occasions. We just can't bring ourselves to study and get the work done until the night before the test. Other examples, uh, if given time, engineers will try to improve the design just a little bit more, or other things come up. We got interruptions, we got other things that are pulling us off of our the, the assigned task. Plus, what's the reward for getting done early with the task? You got to go home early, take the take the next day off and get done early. Yeah, no, no, we get to get rewarded with more work to do the next time and greater expectations. So, for all of our projects, you know, if this is our project, and all these tasks are start out long uh, and then go late. They're, they're either on time or late. Then what happens to our project schedules? Yeah, it takes one of these tasks to be late, and if the rest of them are on time, the project's late. Yeah, they start out long and get even longer. So we can't operate in this mode and expect to get done on time very often. Um, we have to eliminate those task buffers and try to focus on the task instead. But basically, these, these task buffers, you know, we end up using them on a variety of higher priorities, which really should delay our task, and lower priorities, which shouldn't. Because we don't, but we don't really see the difference. We don't really know which ones are higher and which ones are lower, and we can't separate the two, so we end up doing it all. Wherever we do a lower priority instead of a higher priority that's multitasking, that delays our project. Okay, so here we've depicted the same picture of student syndrome, Parkinson's law again, within the resource pipeline we were looking at earlier. So it's really the same picture. Effort, work per day on the vertical, duration on the horizontal, and area is the total work. And you know, basically, task buffers encourage multitasking. And we end up using those task buffers coming in on time, scrambling maybe sometimes to be on time with that, sometimes showing up late, sometimes not really being done with the task, sometimes having to put off higher priorities, things we know are probably higher priorities in, in order just to meet that due date. And the result is very often stress, certainly it's more risk and errors, and it's lower. Better to eliminate that encouraged multitasking, eliminate the due dates, the um, the task buffers, focus on the task until it's complete, and then move on to the next thing. We get to focus on the task until it's complete. We minimize the total amount of work. You know, the amount of stuff we have to fit through this pipeline gets minimized, results in fewer mistakes, fewer unmitigated risks, and overall it gives us higher confidence, happier team, and a much faster project, which is money in our pocket. Um, so rather than buffering each and every task, we estimate them at the what we call the 50-50 duration. 50% 50 chance it'll be done a little early, 50% chance it's going to be a little late, later than we estimate. And that's what we call 50-50. Sometimes we call them focus durations. 
Now, there's still uncertainty in the lengths of the tests. You know, we're not sure exactly when we're going to be done with that. And there are many reasons, for many reasons, the tasks are continue to be longer than the 50-50 estimate, more than they're shorter than the 50-50 estimate, especially, especially if we can't keep from multitasking or overloading our resources. So uh, we put a project buffer at the end to accommodate the uncertainty in our task estimates. And the confident completion date is at the end of the project buffer. And that's what we say is the promise date. We then use our buffer charts to track the performance of the project by tracking the rate of buffer consumption. Here's the milestone that's tied to all of the predecessor tasks uh, that get us to the end of our project. And we track how much this milestone moves over time. And we plot this horizontal position of the milestone relative to the buffer on the vertical in a buffer chart. And we put a new stamp on there for where that milestone is each week. And we do what it takes to stay in the green or we know our project's going to be late. Overall, we complete the project a lot earlier and get a lot more certainty on it. Um, you know, certainly more than the buffer the tasks mode and be late on a lot of the, a lot of the occasions. So notice, too, that the green area is slanted. You know, that leaves a little bit of buffer early and a little bit of buffer late. And the people early in the project, the engineers, marketing, the, they can't eat up all the buffer and leave no room for the downstream people, quality and manufacturing, to have to use, you know, leave no buffer for them to use. If we go in the yellow, we go in the red early, we recognize that early, and it's up to the people that are doing those jobs to try to conserve and retain that buffer. So um, certainly, you know, there's a significant cultural change. We have to let go of task due dates and you know, using those to try to drive our system and replace them with estimates rather than commitments. And so back in the back of our heads, we're all thinking the same thing. You know, what's going to happen if we release some of these guys from some of these resources from commitments you know, and due dates on their tasks? Well, certainly the concern is, well, they're just going to keep working on it forever. And it's going to go far longer than it would ever, even if I, if I put a due date on it. Um, but, so, but there are other ways besides due dates to keep those tasks from growing endlessly. First and foremost is visibility to work. Second, clear priorities and criticality. If that resource knows that they're critical on this project or are going to be critical soon if they don't get done, and once they know these, they're going to let go of it a lot more easily. That stand up meetings, a little attention in a stand up meeting, checking in with that resource, anything we can do to help you get that done, that project or that task done a little earlier, that's big in helping prevent these uh, from extending out into forever, even if there isn't a clear due date. And when all that's not enough, we pull a, a technique from Agile called the definition of done, where on those tasks that we're concerned about this risk, we just make it very clear what it means to be done and are you there yet? And what can we help you get do to get there? With all of this, we end up with a system that moves much faster, way faster than the clogged up due date driven push system. Uh, yeah, looks like we have a question here. It always comes up right, right about now. How big is the project buffer need to be usually? Um, so I'll go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Uh, in the old days of critical chain and uh, they, they basically do a, a root sum square of the variances between the 50-50 durations and the safe durations of the tasks that are on the critical chain. And it's very much, very much like a statistical tolerance stack up. For any of you who do doing statistical tolerance analysis, the, the lengths of those task bars in a, in a project schedule and a Gantt chart are just like the lengths of the parts, and they would treat them as such. They do root sum square on the variances on those tasks. Uh, eventually, though, you know, they were trying to apply those techniques to more uncertain projects like product development. Uh, those buffers were coming out a little small, and they were complicated, and people didn't understand them. So they replaced the RSS idea with a simpler version, sum the variances, and divide by two. Uh, that makes it a little longer, but even then, 
especially in the uncertain world of product development, especially when you have a bunch of different projects going on at the same time, it's really not all that predictive. So what we have to all consider really to get a, a better estimate and for the size of what the buffer needs to be uh, are the, all the items we see here. Um, the standard, the baseline, if we have a uh, clear critical chain, one clear critical chain and the rest have ample slack on them, there's very little multitasking across projects or within the project, and uh, there's sort of just an average level of risk, and we're doing a decent job of mitigating that average level of risk. Uh, it, it, the buffer size ends up being about a third of the total length of the project. Uh, but it grows fairly significantly from there as we have multiple critical chains. If we're just guessing at the work estimates or guessing at availability, uh, if we have a lot of multitasking going on, um, or if you're not really managing risks, all of those will necessarily make our, our buffers need to be bigger. But in general, it's buffers and buffer charts, they're not so much about predicting when the project's going to be complete. That is a part of them. But they're very, as much or more about control, having a control mechanism over the project giving us some visibility and control over the project about what we need to do. Now, in order to get this control, we think we need to do our buffers a little differently than what traditional critical chain methods would recommend. Um, in the traditional critical chain method, you, you just kind of manage, the, you, you plot the one uh, milestone as it tracks over time. In our recommendation, we plot instead multiple milestones. They're all the end dates of the predecessors for the major milestone we're trying to track to. Um, I'll get to that more here in a second. Uh, in addition to this, we don't only track the buffer on the end of the project. We put little buffers at the major milestones that we have along the way. So for example, a nine-month project, we have a three-month buffer. We might put five weeks to get worth a buffer to get to the first beta alpha build, uh, four weeks to get to the beta build, and three weeks to get to the B and B build, or to the end of the project, or whatever. Um, basically, we divide up the project and put more focus on the near-term milestone that way, which facilitates more of a race mentality on the team. Then, yeah, then what we do is the predecessors of that major milestone, any of them that are critical or near critical, we plot those on the chart. That gives us a lot of great information, which we can see here. So we can see just by looking at the chart what's critical. You know, we can see by looking at this that CCU is the one that's facing our system today. And if we can put a little extra something into accelerating the CCU, we'll accelerate our project. We can also see pretty clearly just how much we can get out by accelerating CCU. If we can save five days on the CCU, chain, well, that's really only necessarily probably going to save us two days on the project because something else is going to be critical. You know, if we save more than two days, it's not necessarily going to pay us back as much as we might think, and being able to see that as well. Another thing is you can sort of see the trends in the, in the contributors for this milestone. You know, which one of these had CCU firmware or software, these different subsystems, which one's racing up and about to pass our CCU and become critical next? We can see that pretty clearly. That's the software. Software, the trends in software are that it's getting longer and longer, and it's about to push out and become critical next. And maybe that's where we ought to turn our attention before it's too late and we lose some buffer before it's too late. A lot of great information, which if we had at our fingertips, if the team has at their fingertips, we make nice, good, decisions and we essentially have more control over the outcomes of our project and more certainty in our schedules and our ability to meet them. Okay. Uh, so and our team has it too. Our team has the, the information they need to make good decisions and uh, something that's going to help create a really race each other to the finish line mentality on the team. So in summary, we can't really drive the system quickly with two dates and push. Uh, we can drive it more, more quickly with high availability, greater priorities, visibility, and pull. And a little bit of spare capacity, you know, managing the overall amount of work in our system. So uh, this 
realization comes from a focus more really more on overall profits and recognizing the value of speed and a recognition of the high cost of delay in our projects. So we've got another uh, session for questions. We're running a little bit late, so um, yep. why don't we just hold we off on these? Yep. Go ahead. Yep, I think that makes sense. No, no, okay. I, we're, we, we, we have one question, but we're, we're running a little behind. So. Okay, so let's, let's just go over the next, you know, I have like three slides left, and then the summary, and what we're going to talk about on the next one. If we got time after that, then we'll try to ask these questions. So I just want to take a real quick uh, minute to look at the capability of Playbook. Uh, again, we're not trying to dig in very dig deeply to the functionality or show it off too much. We just want to clarify the topics we're discussing by seeing them in action. Uh, so per, first is pull at the resource level. How do we get pull at the resource level? So in Playbook, we enable this by not scheduling tasks out months ahead of time to start on a certain day, like most of the other scheduling tools do. And you can see that what we have is the short term, those things are scheduled in. The more long term they're planned, they're out there and they live in our backlog. And as the plans change, we can always just pull the most important thing from our backlog and start working on that next. Just, this is generally done by the resource themselves. You know, they're going to pull what they see is the most important thing that they can be effective on next, and they'll pull that over and start working it. Sometimes uh, that pull happens in the context of a standing meeting by the project manager or whoever's running the meeting. Of course, the plan updates automatically with what's really happening on the project, and we get instant feedback on the priority of that task. Uh, secondly, clear, correct priorities. So as you can see, you know, it's very much criticality driven. As soon as a lead time changes or the plan changes and the priorities change, that feedback is instantaneous everywhere, all updated in real time. Uh, in this, you can see we have uh, the concept of critical, which is pink. Near critical is orange. Those are the things where there's not very much slack, and a little bit of slip on that might end up making that become critical. So nice early feedback on what needs a little bit of attention. And then uh, yellow, that's further from critical. That's that's normal or, or not near critical. You know, and this is we're the only tool I know of that allow you know has three stage criticality. Other tools, you don't find out that something's critical until it's critical. Here at least you have a little bit of forewarning and time to do something about it. And lastly, uh, in playbook we establish project versus project priorities by uh, establishing major milestones and assigning prior for each of those projects or mini projects. And then we make those priorities on the milestone visible on all of the predecessor tasks. Everywhere you see the task when you want to see this priority. So here we check the box that says show me the priority of the project that this task contributes to. And we can see right there on the task itself what's the priority of the project that this task is a subtask of. And this is instantly visible, too, as priorities on these milestones change. If the management decides this is what's most, most important, we change one number, and it floats everywhere. Okay. All right, so just to wrap this up a little bit, uh, speed, we increase our speed of our projects. We increase our confidence by managing demand and utilization of the system. We start by managing demand utilization and creating pull at each resource, and then work our way up to the system. Minimize multitasking. Part of that is making it visible on a day-to-day -day basis you know, when the work tasks are overlapping with each other. Uh, clear, correct priorities that are updated daily. That's huge in terms of doing all of this as well. Project buffers, not task buffers, and better control charts. Those all increase speed and confidence. But they all require one very important thing, Whoop. and that's visible work. If we can't see the work, really we have a hard time doing any of these things, and we end up with slow clogged up systems. OK, so um, when we get to the next webinar, webinar three, we're going to even increase speed and confidence a little bit more. We're going to talk about how do you have good plans, good models of the project, how do we keep them up to date. And how do we get better, faster feedback on the status of tasks and what's prior and what's a priority today, so we can get more control over our system? Uh, we accomplish these, and we'll talk about this in webinar two via 
decentralized project management and all the great benefits of decentralizing project management and uh, small batching or updates, information flow, et cetera, as well as information flow as well as uh, our design build test loops. Okay. So about wrapped up. Um, have some time left. Which question shall we attack there, Paul? Okay. Yeah, we, we had a question that said, um, uh, let's see, it's with regard to uh, keeping um, utilization, resource utilization lower. And it says, uh, you know, can't we just have a constant stream of back burner projects that people only work on in their spare time and get the same effect but utilize their resources more fully? Mm. Yeah, good question. So, yeah, this is pretty common. We talk about, well, let's, we can't start that project yet. We need to leave some extra room in our system for getting done with the projects that we already have in the system. And that seems unnatural. What's the matter with just having a little project there that people only work about or work in their quote unquote spare time? Well, the problem with that is that that ends up taking some time anyway. There's an email here, there's a meeting there, there's somebody stopping by to ask you some question because it's not, you know, you have other stuff to do, but they don't have other stuff to do, so they come interrupt you with, to help them get their thing done. And even though we think it's back burner and it's only going to fit in the spare time, it forces its way into time that's not spare and ends up delaying those other projects instead. Really, we'd be better off using what little spare time we get in those cases to cross-train people so that we can spread, you know, compress our next project even that much more because then there's shared knowledge and we don't have to stretch it all through the one person who knows how to do something. Okay. Um, kind of in addition to that, let me, let me go ahead and throw out the other idea. This, this question came up on the last webinar about um, you know, is that 30% of extra capacity that we leave for people, is that ultimately wasted? You know, do we end up putting that to good use? And the answer is, well, sometimes we do. A lot of times we do. If we have good you know, visibility to that work and we can move the work around and uh, assign it to people who have some spare capacity, that's absolutely what we do. And uh, that uses up a good portion of that 30%. Some of that 30%, though, might sometimes be people cleaning out their inbox or cleaning up their desks or reading a trade magazine or something else that doesn't really seem like it's contributing to completing the project and maybe even seems like waste to some people. But the analogy here is, you know, we're all taxpayers. We all pay for the highways and there's highways that are going mostly empty all night, every night. Is that keeping us awake? Because we're paying for that capacity to sit there and not get used every night? Well, doesn't keep me awake because I know when that, you know, early in the morning and late in the afternoon on every day, we need that extra capacity. So we pay for it and we're, ha and we're okay with it because we can see the impacts of that, of not doing that, and we can feel that. So it's just a matter of seeing and feeling the work and seeing and feeling the impacts in product development to, to get us to where we're not so worried about that 30% going to waste. It accelerates the project, it pays for a little bit. Yeah, you can accelerate the project a little bit. You can pay for a little bit of time for people to clear out their inboxes. Okay. Well, um, if anyone else, if you have a question, please either type it into the questions um, area in the GoToWebinar uh, panel, or um, raise your hand, and I'll be happy to unmute you. You can ask your question directly. Not seeing anybody raise their hand, Eric, or I'm not getting any new questions. So, okay. well, we're all about uh, getting done early and not using the buffer when we don't need it. So let's get done early and not use the yeah. buffer if we don't need it. Okay. In that case, um, we we do have a quick poll. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. If you could uh, provide us your answer, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for your attention. Um, just a couple things. I will be sending out a link to the recorded webinar 
um, please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Um, and I will send it out from, for the first webinar and the second one um, to everyone. Um, if you hit reply to the email, you can definitely um, ask us questions. And we'd love your feedback, especially if you attended the first and the second one on the interactive nature of the webinar, um, your preferences and things like that. Um, so thank you very much. Really, 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 really appreciate it. Have a great day.